Good afternoon, everyone, and many thanks for the opportunity to present my paper today on the European Union's counter proposal to the TRIPS waiver, where I will look at its opposition to the TRIPS waiver and also to its counter proposals, which I argue are offering me really false promises and delaying real solutions and delaying in particular the adoption and negotiation on a TRIPS waiver. In this context, I'm not going to discuss the um, TRIPS waiver proposal by India and South Africa, because I know that's already been discussed this morning and also in the interest of time, I'm seeking to focus primarily on the EU's approach in this context. However, prior to delving into this approach, I'd like to situate within its broader context and reflect briefly on the global inequity in relation to vaccines um, access for COVID-19 particularly. So for instance, we know recent statistics suggest on the 1st of December that just over 64% of people in high income countries had access to a first dose of a COVID-19 vaccine. This contrasts with a figure of just over 8% in low income countries who have access to a COVID-19, a first dose of a COVID-19 vaccine, so just one in 12 people. So this is a significant gap between high and low income countries. We also know that in November 2021, six times the number of booster doses were being delivered each day in high income states than there were first doses in low income countries. We also have seen in recent days and weeks um, developments of new variants such as Omicron in relation to COVID-19 and we see increasing concern within the scientific community that areas of a population where there is limited access to COVID-19 vaccines and therefore limited um, vaccination within that context can lead to um, the virus growing more rapidly within that context and that in turn can lead to potentially new variants emerging and those uh, new variants, we run the risk that they could be resistant to existing vaccines. Scientific studies are still ongoing in this context in relation to Omicron, but it has to be recognised that um, such issues also highlight the fact that lack of global ex access to COVID-19 vaccines not only is it a moral issue, it also threatens control of the pandemic in all states. And it's within this context that the European Union has continued to oppose the TRIPS waiver, which is seeking to clear intellectual property rights and barriers, which are obstacles in terms of upscaling the production of COVID-19 vaccines, therapeutics and, and diagnostics. So we must recognise that it's within this context and there's increasing pressure on the European Union to reach consider its position. So in terms of the European Union's position in this context, I'm going to first focus on some of its statements in this area and critique both its opposition and also um, its counter proposal or its alternative proposal that it's putting forward. The alternative that the EU is putting forward, as we'll see, is focusing primarily or almost exclusively on compulsory licensing as a potential solution in this context. It's far too narrow in scope, in my view, to be um, a useful solution within this context, particularly for vaccines, and it's delaying real progress for a solution. I'll also um, conclude by highlighting some of the pressures on the European Union at this time and argue that the EU should radically reconsider its position and should support the TRIPS waiver. In terms of the European Union's opposition to the TRIPS waiver, we see early statements of this so soon after India and South Africa put forward their proposal in October 2020, less than two weeks after this, in a um, debate before the TRIPS Council, the European Union in its statement rejected the role of intellectual property rights as an obstacle in the COVID-19 context, saying that there's no indication in its view that intellectual property rights have been a genuine barrier in relation to COVID-19 related medicines and technologies, and also saying that it viewed IP as part of the solution rather than an obstacle in this context. Furthermore, the European Union placed um, you know, key preference on using voluntary licensing solutions, which it felt were the solution within this context. But if such voluntary solutions failed, and if in its view IP became a barrier to treatments or vaccines against COVID-19, it stated that mechanisms would already be available to address this and pointed to the TRIPS flexibilities in this context. Now, this statement and indeed the EU's opposition could be criticised on a number of different levels, but just a few criticisms that could be raised in this context. First of all, the focus here on the EU statement is one which focuses on economic role of intellectual property rights, on IP as incentives, on IP as economic tools. However, intellectual property rights have a far broader scope and function within this context, as I've argued elsewhere. In my view, intellectual property rights also pose a significant governance role. If we consider, for example, a patent, a patent gives a rights holder the ability to um, control who can produce that technology, who can use, who can make the technology that is patented for the duration of a patent, which is generally 20 years, and similar could be said for other intellectual property rights. But what that also does is it allows rights holders to dictate who can access that technology, 
depends on what terms for the duration of the intellectual property rights. And in the COVID-19 context, we've seen that, that has allowed rights holders to dictate who can access um, vaccines first and on what terms in this context, and also can potentially control who can make vaccines because of course, right to manufacture would be controlled also within this um, space, which in turn means that if there is not sufficient agreements with other entities, licensing agreements with other entities to produce such vaccines, that will reduce the amount of vaccines and other health technologies that are being produced, which in turn can increase the artificial scarcity around such products. So rights holders have a significant role, which is not just an economic role. It extends far beyond this to a role in governing in the sense of controlling who can produce, who can make, um, who can access and on what terms. And indeed, we've also seen this play out between states and industry in the sense that um, Given the shortage of vaccines, particularly that have been available, states have been entering into agreements and competing with each other with, um, with industry in order to get access first to vaccines. So it's not necessarily that vaccines would be decided uh, where they would go based on health needs. Rather, it's based on these agreements that are concluded, which shows the power given to rights holders and industry within this context. So this broader role of intellectual property rights as a governance function is not evident within the EU statement in this context and needs to be considered if we are really to problematize what's actually going on within this context. The other thing is the European Union has focused in this statement and in other statements on the role of IPs and sentence. However, this is deeply contested, particularly within the vaccine context. And together with my co-authors, Shiba Tamasetti, Huyong Kang, Luke McDonough and um, Graham Dodfield in May of this year, we published a paper, and one of aspects of this criticizes this kind of incentivization argument, which can be really questioned in this context. I can just point you know, to one example, the fact that vaccines for COVID-19 were um, funded very uh, strongly by public funding, which was to encourage the development of these technologies. And this was a very good thing, and it's to be commended that public funding went into the development of such vaccines, but that also highlights and puts questions around the role of IP as this incentive, because if IP was such an incentive, then why would you also need such a public funding in this context? Surely if it was the incentive, you could have it without that funding. So it, places questions on it. The public funding itself is a good thing, but the idea that IP is a, an incentive, a sufficient incentive or a good incentive within the vaccine context that it can be questioned and has been questioned in literature in the past and also in the COVID-19 context, yet the EU does not reference or engage with that context. Furthermore, the idea that the European Union is focusing on voluntary solutions, in other words, on industry agreeing to licensing agreement, that is leaving discretion almost entirely with rights holders. And that's deeply problematic in a um, health emergency, in particular for COVID-19, because we have seen the Achilles heel of this is the fact that many rights holders may not be willing to engage with systems that are set up to facilitate um, this. Some may be, and that's commendable, but many others may not be. And if we think about this, in recent times, we've had some um, licensing agreements which have been agreed upon, which is, you know, as I've said, deeply commendable, but arguably one factor that may be um, encouraging this is the TRIPS waiver proposal itself, which could be acting and is acting in my view and um, in the view of my co-authors as a lever in order to encourage such licensing agreements because the threat of a waiver, if they don't come about, may be encouraging industry to engage more broadly with licensing agreements in this context. However, even so, the licensing agreements that we have are simply not sufficient to meet the global demand, and particularly to meet the urgent global demands, with urgent that we would have access to um, COVID-19 vaccines as soon as possible, that we would be able to upscale these. The current licensing arrangements are not doing this, and particularly because we now have a booster market as well, some of the products may be and are being um, coming you know, away from the supply of low-income countries and middle-income countries for their first doses, going instead to booster markets in this context. So this is deeply problematic, and there's a failure to meet global demand, and relying on those voluntary solutions is insufficient. And I can just give one further example of this. The COVID-19 technology access pool was set up specifically in solidarity towards the start of this pandemic to encourage industry and others to share intellectual property rights data and know-how around COVID-19 vaccines and other health technologies. Um, in order to upscale their production to address COVID-19, but to date no vaccine manufacturing company has engaged with this um, CTAP initiative. So that highlights again the limited effectiveness voluntary solutions you know, have had some effectiveness, but not sufficient to meet the global demand in this context. So for all of these reasons, the EU's opposition can be questioned. However, the EU's counter-proposal in its own right, also deserves further um, critique because this 
highlights the fact that it's limited at best and also is delaying um, suggestions and proposals for real solutions in this context. So within the counter proposal context, uh, early inclinations of this were its 4th of June statement, where again, this was a communication from the EU to the General Council on the 4th of June. It reiterated existing statements, and I'm not going to expand upon those, but those are on the slide in terms of dismissing the role of IP, in terms of focusing on voluntary licensing, and in terms of its view of IP as incentives. But it also, interestingly then, put forward what it deemed to be an alternative, which was adding legal certainty that it felt was needed in the context of TRIPS flexibilities, which may address the issue. And in particular, it um, viewed and, and stated that compulsory licensing is a perfectly legitimate tool in this context that governments may wish to use in the context of a pandemic if voluntary solutions are not available. Now, it then put forward three main solutions which it felt would increase certainty around compulsory licensing. I'll come on to critique those um, because they're detailed to provide a further detail on those on the 18th of June, but its statement failed to engage with, as I suggest, the limitations of compulsory licensing in this context if one is looking for a global solution, and particularly the limitations of compulsory licensing within the vaccine context. So just in terms of the 18th of June statement, as I said, this put forward greater um, detail on its proposal. And in this context, it was a communication from the EU to the Council for Trips, which put forward a draft general declaration, declaration um, that it was proposing that the trips uh, to the trips agreement that would be adopted. So the objectives of this, it said, was to reaffirm basically members' rights to use trips flexibilities for this purpose, including compulsory licensing. Now, arguably, that's already self-evident within um, the trips agreement, and particularly Doha, given its public health focus. It then also made three main proposals in this context. The first was within the compulsory licensing space that um, it felt that it would be useful to clarify that a pandemic is a national emergency or other circumstance of extreme urgency within the meaning of Article 31B. And that in turn would mean, if it was defined as such, that members, you know, the ordinary requirement is that one would negotiate with a rights holder to seek a license prior to issuing a compulsory license. That um, requirement to negotiate could be waived if it, if the circumstance fell within this definition of natural national emergency. Now, you know, that statement of the EU that this would be um, suggested within the declaration, it's not a bad thing in the sense that there's no harm in additional clarification. However, arguably it does nothing further than what is already contained within the existing um, TRIPS agreement because it is highly plausible that within anyone's interpretation that a pandemic and particularly COVID-19 given the devastation that it's caused would be defined as a national emergency and also would fall within the definition of an extreme urgency, a circumstance of extreme urgency. So the EU saying that this was one of its proposals, whilst it may do no harm, is, you know, is reiterating what is arguably already within the scope and purview of the TRIPS agreement. Next, the European Union's proposal was that members would be able to provide um, that the remuneration reflects price charged by the manufacturer of the vaccine or medicine produced under the compulsory license. Now, there are already existing um, proposals in, this co in the context of guidelines in terms of remuneration for compulsory licensing. Adding further clarification to this, again, you know, may do no harm, but it would depend on the scope of what the EU is proposing in this context. And I'll come back to this point later. It could potentially exacerbate the issues. But the, the problem with this is, again, it's focusing on compulsory licensing. And as I'll highlight, this is not necessarily a real solution because it doesn't necessarily address some of the real problems in this context. Finally, um, its third aspect of its proposal was in relation to Article 31 bis, and it was making suggestions around how Article 31 bis would be operationalized in this context. Now, offering a solution based on Article 31 bis um, is problematic because Article 31 bis has proven extremely difficult to use in the past. And as Knowledge Ecology International have highlighted and other groups indeed, you know, this is a time of extreme urgency, COVID-19. Article 31 bis is something that is not a timely solution because generally it requires negotiation between health and trades officials at both the importing and the exporting countries because Article 31 BIS, what it does is it allows countries to produce products under compulsory licensing and to export them at a to a country that doesn't have the manufacturing capacity or sufficient manufacturing capacity. So that system is one that is uh, cumbersome, it takes a long time generally, and it's not one that's set up to de deal with a global health crisis. It's only been used once in the past, which highlights the problematic nature of this and where time is of the essence arguably it's simply not fit for purpose but more broadly 
the EU's position in this context has to be criticised because its focus is on compulsory licensing, focusing primarily on the patent aspect. And this is the focus on compulsory licensing is insufficient to address the COVID-19 context, particularly for vaccines, as I've argued in the past, and indeed as I've argued with my co-authors in our paper of May of this year. There's several reasons for this, but some of the key ones are that First of all, within the vaccine space in particular, there is multiple intellectual property rights which apply in relation to any vaccine, and there may be multiple rights holders who have such rights in that context. It may also be difficult to determine which rights are applicable, which rights holders should be engaged, and so who you should need to get a compulsory license from. And we know this um, because many of these intellectual property rights, particularly the patents, would be quite recent or new. We also know from uh, Givari and Galick's network analysis of um, RNA uh, vaccines in this context that there are multiple overlapping networks of IP rights that are at play. So even deciphering who one would get compulsory license from um, in terms of which uh, intellectual property right it would apply, which patent it would apply over, can be highly difficult in this context. Furthermore, as I've suggested, there are overlapping layers of intellectual property rights applicable. It's not just patents, it's trade secrets, other intellectual property rights. So just dealing with compulsory licensing within the vaccine space, at least, and not dealing with the other intellectual property um, hurdles does not clear the entire IP hurdles that one would need to clear, and which, the, um, in contrast, the proposal by India and South Africa is suggesting it would do that broad package of measures. The EU's approach, in contrast, is in stark um, is in stark contrast, and it's so much more limited to that broader package. Furthermore, and perhaps the most problematic aspect of this is that compulsory licensing, it's a country by country, product by product, or patent by patent approach. It's not an approach which delivers a timely global solution. You can't get a global compulsory licensing compulsory license under the Trips Agreement. And where timeliness is of the essence, this is highly problematic again. Furthermore, even beyond the scope and the focus on compulsory licensing, many of the European Union's proposals within its counter proposal, they may already be possible, like its proposal in terms of um, the pandemic being viewed as a circumstance of national emergency. Others of its proposal fail to engage with the actual problems that are really at stake in this context. It also fails to engage with the broader function and role of intellectual property rights. And finally, just in terms of the EU's sphere, in terms of what would happen if you passed a TRIPS waiver in this context, the reality is that a TRIPS waiver, what it would likely do is clear the intellectual property, um, it suspend intellectual property rights uh, under the TRIPS agreement. But that does not necessarily mean that jurisdictions, national or European Union, would need to um, offer uh, you know, a waiver of intellectual property rights within their jurisdictions. Instead, it would merely allow states that wish to do that to do so and to clear intellectual property rights for them to produce generic versions um, and to facilitate them to produce generic versions of certain products if needed. But it doesn't force the EU to do this necessarily. So its concerns are arguably you know, really going far beyond the realities of what is likely within this context. Finally, just to, to point to two further documents. So there's been certain leaks in this context, both in September and in October. There was a leaked document from the DG, according to me, from the DG Trade in the European Union, which again reiterated the European Union's opposition to the TRIPS waiver, and also um, highlighted that the European Union's proposal was an alternative in its view, not complementary to the waiver proposal, which I think is important. Furthermore, then, the Huffington Post leaked a document in October 2021, which provides further detail on the proposals made in June. Now, that document is interesting because it used the language of waiver to highlight what the EU is proposing, which, you know, arguably is a misnomer because it's not necessarily a waiver that the EU is proposing, and it's also potentially confusing. But nonetheless, what it also did was it detailed or provided further detail on the EU's proposals. And you can see them here in the quotes and some of my critiques of these within the blue. So the detailed uh, proposals, first of all, it said that Article 31B, which is the provision which requires negotiation with rights holders generally for a compulsory license, that, that would be waived. Now, that would be useful, but that's already provided for, as we know, within the TRIPS agreement in the context of a circumstance of national emergency or extreme urgency, which COVID-19 would undoubtedly, in my view, fall within. It also suggested in Article 31F, the requirement generally that one if, if one is producing products under compulsory license that those would be supplied predominantly to the domestic market would be waived. Now, Article 31 bis already allows this under certain circumstances, but this, as I've said, has been cumbersome in practice. So waiving Article 31F may be a direct or a useful mechanism, and indeed Ellen Tahone also highlights this. However, 
it is not clear how the EU would envisage this operating with Article 31 bis, because if the one did that, one may not need, one would not need rather Article 31 bis, but the next line of its document says, Article 31 bis mechanisms for compulsory licensing for exports would be waived. Now, further detail is needed on this because if one adopted what it was suggesting it was doing in Article 31 F, one would not need this. So how do those aspects of the proposal fit with each other? And finally, the European Union makes recommendations in terms of remuneration under compulsory licensing to adopt specific rules. Much more detail would be needed on what it's envisaging there. Potentially, it might alleviate issues, but it also could exacerbate issues if, for example, um, that was proposing another mechanism under the WTO with further um, bodies were to be involved in this context, but more detail is needed to offer full critique of that aspect. Finally, the document suggests that various aspects would be excluded from the scope of the EU's proposal, in particular, Article 28.1, which is to do with the rights conferred by patents, um, Article 39, which is to do with protections for undisclosed information like trade secrets that are extremely important, particularly in the vaccine context, and Part 3, which is to do with enforcement of intellectual property rights under the Troops Agreement, that those would be outside the scope of what it was proposing. That greatly narrows the scope of the EU's proposal and creates potentially uncertainty. In terms of reactions to this proposal, many legal experts in the field have criticised this strongly, including Knowledge Ecology International, Jean Love, who've highlighted that the Article 31 BIS mechanism, which the EU is relying on in this context, um, in some aspects of the proposal, is a very bad option by everyone who's tried to use it. By Ellen Tohone and Pascal Boulet, who've suggested that its proposals are mostly meaningless. By Brooke Baker, who's highlighted it as wholly inadequate and said that EU convergence would lead us back to the swamp of ineffectual solutions at best under the guise of a breakthrough compromise. In my view, put simply the EU proposal, it fails to address the actual issues at stake, it delays progress on a waiver and does so in the context of ongoing global inequity in relation to vaccines and other health technologies. The EU position, however, is increasingly under pressure. Some member states like Italy, Spain, Greece and France have um, suggested their support for the waiver. Other member states' pressure is coming on them to do similarly. Civil society activists, advocacy rather, is focusing at the EU, the national level. We see some pictures of this, including in the Irish context recently, and also um, at EU buildings. The EU Parliament it has adopted a resolution on the 25th of November, where it also called for the EU to support the granting of a TRIPS waiver. Finally, the European Union states have human rights obligations, and those obligations arguably are simply not being met by the ongoing delay of the European Union in supporting and actually by its opposition to the TRIPS waiver proposal. So just to conclude um, briefly on this in the interest of time, the EU counter proposal to the TRIPS waiver, in my view, it's not a solution to the underlying issues posed for the reasons just given. It's delaying progress on real solutions and in particular on negotiating a TRIPS waiver and the EU I would argue should urgently reconsider its position in order to facilitate solutions towards global equity for vaccines to address the current global inequity, both for moral reasons and also due to the risks to all states. And the EU should be concerned about its legacy in this context in terms of its response to COVID-19 for this and future um, pandemics. There is also beyond the EU's response, I think, a much greater need to recognise the broader role of intellectual property rights. They're not merely economic tools, which COVID-19 has again shown, their impacts on human health and their impacts on human rights that are at stake. So thank you for listening. Um, and I've also highlighted here just some of the references to some material I've been discussing within this presentation.